Welcome to the November general membership meeting here at the Coalition on Homelessness. I've seen in the chat that this is some folks first time. We've got some new individual members. We've got some amazing guests joining us. So thank you and welcome. We're really excited to have you here and um, grateful to be in community um, and uh, collective action with you all. Um, hopefully you can all see the screen and you can see our agenda. Um, you should be able to change your Zoom box name to add whatever name you prefer, add your pronouns, uh, add your uh, agency. Um, also doing that in the chat is awesome. We appreciate that. I believe someone already enabled um, closed captioning, but that is an option for you as well down at the bottom. Um, we do record this, and um, as many of you may know, the amazing Tim takes wonderful notes and writes up a beautiful blog, really summarizing and capturing all of the wonderful information, resources, links, any um, presentation slides, which I do believe we will have some from um, the King County Veterans Program, and we throw all of that and the video up on our blog and on YouTube. Um, so be looking for that and we'll share all those links for you so it's handy and easy and bookmarked. Um, I'm going to preview this now, but if one of you might get up the uh, courage here in a little bit to read our mission, vision and values, it will be on the screen. So, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to send out an invitation and courage for someone in the audience to do that. But we um, have, um, uh, we are co-sponsoring the Behavioral Health Legislative Forum and uh, Christina uh, Kutsubos, Kutsubos, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, will be here to share a little bit of information about that. It's November 20th. It's an amazing event. Um, Megan Stanley from the King County Veterans Program is gonna be here to talk about really some amazing services that this program provides for veterans. And this is a, hopefully you saw this in our, in our emails and our messages, but this is a much wider definition of a veteran and includes a lot of folks that may not identify as such, family of a veteran, folks that maybe only served one day. Um, so lots of really great information um, coming our way there. Um, the coalition staff has lots of information to share. We're going to kind of recap the election results, talk about our um, voting rights and registration work that we did um, most recently for the general election and what it's we're hoping it could look like in 2024 um, outside of election cycles. And then, of course, we are going to talk all things budget, King County and City of Seattle, we're going to talk about the Vet Seniors and Human Services Levy Implementation Plan. Um, this is uh, amazing ways with which you can participate in our democracy. Um, so we will have uh, action for you all to take. Um, and then I saw several of you um, throwing in some really great resources. And I believe we will have time for community um, updates and sharing. And so... Um, Please feel free if you have, um, you know, some timely resources or information that you want to share with folks at the end. We'll do that. Um, I think I've captured everything that I usually like to capture in our introduction. So do I have a loving and brave soul that will read our mission, vision, and values? I'll do it. Oh, great. Take it away. <laughs> All right. The mission. We mobilize our community to challenge systemic causes of homelessness and advocate for housing justice. Vision, a region that acts on a shared sense of responsibility to ensure that everyone has a home and the values of equity, justice, and collective action. 
Thank you. Um, as Allison put in the chat, um, this is something that we have long done as a history and practice at the coalition and really just trying to ground our meetings in, in those um, values that we have. Um, and, you know, I think it solidifies that we are truly a community doing this um, together. Um, so thank you. And I saw uh, Sagiva hand went up and I presumably you were volunteer. No, he's like shaking his head. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, so as I said, we are gonna um, kick off this first um, part here with the Behavioral Health Legislative Forum. We were kind, kindly invited to co-sponsor this um, and we are gonna be um, at this event. Um, there's a pre-event where we'll be uh, doing voting rights and registration work. Um, and then the event itself is pretty amazing. Um, We'll share a link here. And Christina, thank you so much for joining us to share a little bit more about this. Um, what I have heard to be an amazing event. I actually haven't attended, so I'm super excited. And when I heard more about it, I was like, how have I missed this? Where, where has this been all my life? Where have I been all my life? So Christina, please, please take a few minutes to share about this um, event. Yeah, happy to. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, Jody, I feel the same way as you. I have never been to this event either, but um, the more I learn about it, the more excited I am to be um, to be planning it, and I can't wait until it all comes together on Monday. So, um, uh, yeah, this is the Behavioral Health Legislative Forum. We're King County sponsoring it, the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division. I've been with them for about um, a month and a half, actually. Uh, and before that, I was with uh, Seattle City Council member Lisa Herbold and have been uh, working in your world for quite a long time before that. So I'm especially happy and grateful to be here and to have um, Pitch's support and uh, co-sponsorship uh, for this event. So um, it is a co-production. We have producing partners with uh, Washington Recovery Alliance and um, King County Recovery Coalition. The flow of the event is pretty amazing. Uh, doors open around four o'clock. It's at Seattle Center. Um, and we have an hour and a half of um, uh, activity tables. And I understand that Fitz will be doing voter registration, which I think is fantastic. Um, I get ready because we have uh, almost 550 people registered, which I think is extraordinary. Yeah, these are um, members of the recovery community. However, um, folks define that for themselves, folks in recovery from substance use disorder, from mental health concerns um, coming together. We have providers coming. Uh, we have organizations like you coming. Um, so in addition to the voter registration, um, there's gonna be a video where you can re record a video about your recovery story. There's gonna be a storytelling workshop where you can get some coaching on how to talk about your recovery story in the most effective way, perhaps to lawmakers, particularly. Um, there's gonna be uh, naloxone training. The first 100 people get free naloxone, which I think I'm very psyched about. Um, and if you hit up all the booths, then you get a free t-shirt at the end, which is kind of great. <laughs> we also have an art exhibit from the Recovery Cafe that people can um, check out. So that's sort of, that's called Recovery in Action. That's the pre-event. Between six and seven, we have, I'm looking at my list here, I think we're up to um, 20 state elected representatives coming. We have some county council members. We have some city council members. Um, and we have some aides for state count, uh, state legislators as well as Congresswoman Del Bene. Um, they're gonna be seated at tables. They're gonna be um, uh, sitting ducks for anyone who would like to come and uh, talk to them about what they should be focusing on for the state legislative session, um, what their policy priorities should be around behavioral health and um, to share the recovery story that you just had some help um, from coaching on. Um, so literally for an hour, they're sitting at tables and you get to go up and talk to them and tell them whatever's on your mind. Um, after that, from 7 to 8.30, we move into a different area where it's more formal program with a, a stage. Um, 
our new uh, division director, Susan McLaughlin, will stand up. She will, it will be sort of introducing herself to the broader recovery community. She's pretty new. Um, and she will unveil King County's uh, state legislative priorities regarding behavioral health for the 2024 session. So that'll be the first time that we really share them. Um, and uh, actually it will be the first time we share them because they're still in development, as you can imagine, <laughs> right up until the very last minute. Uh, we're going to have uh, Executive Constantine will provide some remarks. Um, and we have four recovery speakers who will be sharing their stories on stage. Um, pretty brave, courageous people, I think, including one high school student who's gonna be sharing their story. I'm very psyched and very grateful that they've been willing to do this in front of such a large crowd. Um, the thing I love about this, besides getting to hear these stories, is that we put all those state legislators up on stage, listening to these stories. And then at the end of the night, we pass around the microphone and we ask them to share what they've learned tonight. We ask them to reflect on what they've heard. And we ask them to talk about um, how they're going to put that to work um, to, to, make, uh, to make our services, to make our systems better for these folks. So um, that's sort of the night, it's, it's the, the launch to our uh, work on the state legislative session anyway. Um, this is our first time back in person since 2019. And I can tell you like the energy is pretty electric. People are super psyched to be gathering back in person together. I feel it too. Um, I would love it if any of you come, all of you, please. <laughs> um, we ask that you register, you don't have to, it is open to the public. You can literally just stumble in at the last minute um, and you will be very welcome. Um, oh, Holly, thank you so much for sharing the, uh, the link. It is free. It is open to the public. We would love it if you share it with anyone you think might be interested. Um, and again, thank you so much for co-sponsoring this, for helping get out the word um, and for doing the voter registration, which I was super psyched about when I heard. Um, any questions, anything more I can tell you about the event? Way, hey, Allison, while folks are thinking or typing. Hey, Allison. Hi, Christina. Thank you so much. It it sounds wonderful. I just thought I would chime in to say I have been to this event. <laughs> and everything she said is true. And, and I want to just remind people this is a wonderful opportunity to invite the residents, guests, clients you're working with uh, in a variety of settings to attend as well. It, even if they don't want to say anything. It is a very welcoming, very friendly space and a really powerful memory that I have um, from attending pre-COVID is the experience of sitting at a table with elected officials and with people um, you know, at our table who had a variety of experiences, including homelessness, substance use, um, many experiences of life and just listening to the conversation between them. It's not that often that we have spaces where there is actual conversation. Um, passing around the microphone at the end is brilliant and I love it and we are going to steal it. Um, but also the not so public spotlight dialogue is really powerful as well. And one of the things that really stayed with me is the folks who were at the table um, who had never spoken to an elected official before saying, wow, I, I can't believe that was my state representative and I just sat and talked to her for 20 minutes. Um, so think about who in the worlds where you work um, might really enjoy that experience and um, invite them to join. And they don't have to stay the whole time. That's the other thing. So thank you so much, Christina. We're all really excited to attend. No, I love hearing that. And I I can't tell you how many stories I've heard like that of people who have been to the event and just found something that like really touched their heart. Um, and I just love the idea of this being a, a place for the community to gather, um, a place to celebrate recovery, a place to share that message that recovery is real and recovery is possible. Hi. 
Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm just going to give it a quick sec here to see if anybody has any other questions or anything's coming up in the chat. I do see Mark um, noted. It sounds like a remarkably empowering event. I could not agree more, Mark. Um, but keep throwing stuff in the chat. We'll answer it if we can. We'll follow up with Christina if we need to, but um, I am going to uh, move us on to our next section here. And Tim, are you back and with your audios doing okay? So far. Yay! So far. I'm handing yeah. it. I'm handing the, the mic to my wonderful colleague, Tim. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, uh, you know, we're talking about a lot of different inspiring stories from around our community today. And another one of which is going to um, be from our, um, an important, uh, being, uh, being one of our board members, Megan Stanley, who is going to be talking about King County Veterans Program, a remarkably, worked with a lot uh, of people Tim, is it, uh, i'm your audio is cutting out for me okay allison is mm. also okay do you want to introduce that yes great <laughs> sorry you're having so much audio issue <laughs> um as tim was saying we have um megan stanley from the king county veterans program here and um i really when I first heard about uh, this program and the amazing work they do and the wide reach that their services um, capture when we think about military experience, um, veterans and the individuals and, and the, the family that, that um, they support, um, both Tim and I were like, we need to bring these folks uh, to, a, to a general membership meeting. So we are really excited to have Megan here. Um, and I, on that note, I'm just going to let you take it away and do your thing. Um, do you want, uh, are you okay sharing screen? I should be, you okay. know, technology is always a real wild card, but um, before I share, just so people can see faces. Um, hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I have three screens. So I'm sort of looking all around, but um, yeah, as Jody and Tim said, I'm the Veterans Administrator for King County. I work within our Department of Community and Human Services. Um, and I'm just, I'm really, really lucky to have this amazing job where I both get to oversee our two direct service sites, which include our case managers working every single day with veterans, you know, mission critical staff. Um, and I get to oversee our policy making around our veterans work. So really lucky, I think, to have sort of a foot in both worlds. And um, I'm going to talk to you about KCVP, King County Veterans Program. I do love it. I'm very passionate about it. Um, and I can talk a lot, but I'm going to try to keep to time today. Um, and later, I'll put my info in the chat. I am always, always, always happy to take questions, even if you want to just talk through someone that you're working with, happy to do that. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Okay, well, let's see. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? We are and your kind of preview slides, but we're seeing your screen. Oh, shoot. Let me stop because this is the problem with having three screens. You never quite know which one is going to share. Um, okay. I'm then going to show. And while Megan is working on pulling that up, I threw a little summary. There you go. That's the, that's the screen you want, Megan, and a link to the to the website for the program. Okay. It's I think it's working now. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, so I already sort of said King County Veterans Program. So we are part of local government, but I think, you know, do really different things than I've seen done anywhere else. And, and part of our work is flexibility. So I'm going to sort of go through what we do, why we're different um, than I think a lot of other programs, 
um, some of our funding and then really dig into our services specific to housing because I think that is what is important to all of you. Um, so just to get started, um, as I said, comprised of two direct service sites. So we're in Tukwila and Northgate. Our Northgate office is literally like a half a block, a block um, from the light rail stop. So super accessible and we do provide transportation assistance. So, you know, that looks like um, bus passes, ORCA cards, you know, if we have someone with like a real mobility challenge that can't use public transit, um, we might be able to get an Uber for them. So really, you know, we say we try to get to the yes, make sure that people can access services. Um, we have walk-in hours every day. And that is really how somebody, if you have someone who needs to be served has never been to us before, or they haven't been in the past six months, they come through walk-ins. Um, and that's 8.30 to 11 and then one to three every day. So sort of a lunch break in there. And somebody can come, you know, at 12.30 and just um, hang out in our lobby. Both lobbies also have computer labs with a bunch of computers. And so there are also, you know, resources they can access there, a table with employment opportunities. Um, Northgate has a little library through Seattle Public Library. So uh, they can come in. A really, really, really important thing and like the number one thing or one of the number one things we try to convey is someone doesn't need to be eligible for VA services to be assisted by us. And I would say probably the majority of people that we see, um, we're seeing because other systems for veterans aren't available to them. And often they've been told they're really not a veteran in some ways, they're not self-selecting. So if you are doing um, an assessment with them or an intake form and say, oh, you're a veteran, a lot of these people will say no. And so we really try to reframe it um, as, have you ever served a day in the military? And actually I'm gonna jump ahead beyond funding um, just to talk about eligibility. So veteran, anyone who ever served a day in the military, it could have been a day at boot camp, and then it wasn't for them. Um, guard and reserve, which is not served by other systems federally or at the state level. Regardless of discharge status, this is huge. We have so many people that for a variety of reasons, often mental health or gender identity um, have gotten a dishonorable discharge that you know, I can say is really unfair, um, but also it just precludes them after they have served our country from getting really necessary services. So that's really, really important to us. Um, we also do have legal aid to help with discharge upgrades. So not only would we serve them, we will also try to get them an upgrade so they can be potentially eligible for those other services. Um, the other really flexible definition we have, and so between these two, I'm hoping actually a lot of you serve these people. Um, you know, I won't like read exactly what it says, but basically a family member is anyone who's living in their household or cohabitating so that they don't need to be housed necessarily. Um, and they just mutually depend on each other. Or this happened in the past year. And so we often have somebody um, present where the veteran has passed away, but they relied on them, they lived with them. Um, and so we still equally serve that person. So in everything except our housing vouchers because of some federal mandates, they get the exact same service, same financial assistance, um, all of those things. Another thing that comes up, and especially you know, for folks that haven't had stable housing, they don't have a lot of places to keep documents and keep up with them for years. I used to work in shelter and you know, so few people had documents that they needed and part of you know the work is helping them get them. So flexibility exists in establishing that. They don't need to come with their official DD-214 from the military. Um, we can help them get that if they need it. Uh, we all have access to a VA system where we can look people up. We just need their social security number and date of birth. So we can also, you know, we've had veterans who don't show up in that system, but they show us pictures of when they were in service um, and so like we can even do that again really trying to get to the yes and on the back end we can request those forms, but we don't want to create that upfront barrier to get them service. Um, so between those two things, you know they say there's 115,000 veterans in King County, those are sort of like your official, the VA says you're a veteran. I would say between our definition and family members you're looking at hundreds of thousands of people that would qualify for our services. Go back just really quickly. I think you all know the Veteran Seniors and Human Services levy passed on August 1st with over 70% approval. And thank you all um, for support and advocacy around that. So that is about 60% of our budget at KCVP. 
And then about 40% is a state tax levy that is a really consistent um, form of funding that's not a six year levy, um, the Veterans Relief Fund. It has stricter criteria, um, really mirroring that federal one, but we braid the dollars so that even when we're putting it into a program, it doesn't limit us. We have a host of services, and again, I'll sort of focus on housing, but um, financial assistance, we so far by the end of October this year um, gave out $2.5 million in financial assistance directly to veterans. Um, over 60% of that was housing. So the biggest thing we pay is rent, back rent, anything for eviction prevention, moving costs, utilities, um, just basic needs so we can give them Safeway cards for food or Target cards, um, a Visa gift card to go get a, a cell phone or phone minutes if they need that. Um, you know, we even pay for things like car repairs if someone needs that car repaired to get to work. Um, super flexible financial assistance and that is probably the biggest thing that we do. Um, we also have employment navigators. I'll talk about housing stability. Um, we, uh, another big thing is help in applying for those government benefits. So VA service-connected disability, a VA pension, as well as you know SSI, SSDI, state programs, whatever it might be. Um, we have a legal partner, Northwest Justice Project, and they hold 24 slots for us every week. And we directly schedule people onto that calendar. So somebody can call, say, I need legal help. I need you know, to help in applying for, applying for benefits, or I need legal help because I'm about to be evicted, or I need a reasonable accommodation. They handle all of those for us, and we can just directly put people on the calendar, which is usually that week or within the next week. So really, really responsive legal aid as well. Um, and then we do, you know, it's an unfortunate thing, but end of life and burial assistance, um, which is a cost that families often incur and, and can't pay for. So we work directly with um, the cemetery and with, um, with different funeral homes for that. Okay, the meat of it, housing stability services. So we really see our two offices as direct service hubs, right? You're coming in one door and you're getting a lot of different services and not just through us. Some people you know, don't, rightfully so, don't trust the government, don't want our services as much. Um, they might wanna work with a community partner who we work with. Um, so things we do around housing, um, I sort of mentioned foreclosure prevention and eviction prevention. I will say some of these partners that are listed were going into a new levy, so they might change. Um, I keep you all updated about that. Um, eviction prevention, that's really multiple agencies. It's uh, our financial assistance, it's the legal aid help, and then our supportive services for veteran families, SSVF, um, which is through Sound, YWCA, and Catholic Community Services, all of which come on site every week to KCBP. Um, and they also that's where people get connected to rapid rehousing, emergency housing assistance, which is short-term hotel stays, um, a lot of different options there. The really big thing, I'm gonna talk about this um, on a slide really soon, is our collaborative case management program. It is a housing voucher program. We, I don't wanna say own, um, we control sort of these vouchers. The VA has given them over to us um, and so, you know, referrals are made to us and we really get decision making power around that and also are able to make services really quick and responsive so we can get vouchers a lot quicker. We know the average time frames across the board so we know um, that it is faster. The number right here that says we manage 188, I'm really excited to say that this past week we found out um, that is with King County Housing Authority. We had applied to also do it with Seattle Housing Authority. And after 15 long months, the VA secretary signed off on it. Um, so that immediately, like as of today, gives us a hundred more vouchers, which is just huge. Um, and then we're expecting another 15 um, in January. We get 15% of a housing authority's cash vouchers. So 288 and then we'll be over 300 um, in just a couple of months. So we're just so excited about this. Um, for those of you who you know don't dig into our veteran by name list for King County, right now there are about 800 
known to us homeless veterans. So even getting 100 vouchers right away is a really big piece of this work. Our housing vouchers, just to be clear, uh, VASH and project-based VASH tend to be people with higher clinical needs. So they need the sort of in-community, in-home case management um, or on-site where they live. Ours is lower acuity and sort of um, the office-based case management that KCVP provides. What we tend to see, the average age is 55 and the average income is 1300 a month. So we tend to see your aging veteran who is just on a fixed income and is really unlikely to increase that to the point where they could afford housing. And so this is a really important long-term long -term resource. And I've talked about most of this next slide already. Um, the one thing that I will point out here is that it does still utilize that federal veteran definition. And this is what I was saying. It's the only thing that's really different for us. Um, we can look that up really quickly. So if you have somebody you're thinking of referring, we can look up for you. Go ahead and make the referral and we can tell if they're eligible or not. The VA did um, about a year and a half ago expand eligibility for veterans with an other than honorable discharge, which was also a pretty big thing. So we have a wider pool now. If we say that we um, can't provide the voucher, it's either not a good fit, we don't have one available, um, we will always refer them to what we think is the next best service to get um, stable housing. Going on to shelters, and I know I'm going quickly, so feel free to put things in the chat. Um, at the moment, we have um, contracts with multiple different shelters these are for veteran set-aside beds. So what's unique is this doesn't go through KCRHA. These are completely funded by KCVP. Um, and so the referrals come through us. Again, you know, using that really flexible definition, um, but we have right of referrals. The bed is held, you know, whether it's filled or not, it is held because we're paying for it every night. Um, so whenever there's an available bed and a veteran walks in and wants shelter, um, we can place them in that. Again, some of these I think are subject to change in number or in agency. Um, right now, 30 beds at William Booth, six at what used to be congregations, I think is now called Porch Light, um, 10 beds through Compass Auto's place, two female identifying beds at Angeline's place through the Y. We have six beds, which is the whole house at Burian House, which is transitional. And um, we are really excited. Another big thing is we will be opening the first in the nation LGBTQ veteran transitional housing um, starting next year. The money for procuring a house has already been awarded. They're looking for one right now. It will be operational next year. This is really going to be hopefully a safe space for this population of veterans who is often told you're not welcome at this shelter. You make other people uncomfortable. They just don't feel comfortable walking in. Um, and this will provide up to a two year stay. So really that true transitional, you know, it's not, you have six months and then you need to have a placement, understanding the needs of that population, um, they might need more time. We know that we will be procuring, we're getting six additional shelter beds. I can already tell you that, um, male identifying, and we are procuring early next year for more female identifying, um, hopefully five to 10 more beds. So trying to always expand that. I will go quickly through this. Um, we have a wellness program, and this might be of interest to a lot of you. Again, anyone who qualifies um, for KCVP, we have a separate financial assistance where they can get anything related to wellness. So mobility, hearing aids, dental, those are our biggest things. Um, you know, maybe it's co-pays or out-of-pocket medical costs, short-term in-home care, which is really expensive, and we can help bridge the gap until someone gets a Medicaid assessment. Um, and really other wellness related costs that come up. Um, and we try to be pretty flexible. We do, and I should have mentioned this before, our eligibility for KCVP is up to 60% of AMI. So 50 some hundred a month for a single person household. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, I know that they just went up recently um, and they just need to be enrolled in KCVP, same eligibility otherwise. Um, one other important thing is we, are, we serve King County residents. If somebody has an intention to move to King County in the next 30 days, we will also serve them. So you might encounter somebody who's in Pierce County or Kitsap or Snohomish, 
or really anywhere, because we have people discharged and coming to King County, we can start serving them 30 days out. Um, and they don't need to pro provide us like a lease or an employment offer letter. It's just saying, I intend to do this. Um, and we have, you know, a veteran right now that we're talking about who's in the repatriation program. And so they're, be, they're in Mexico, they'll be coming back intending to live in King County. And so we can already start serving them to get their benefits in place. Um, other big thing, we provide free mental health counseling for vet veteran service members and their families uh, in, the, in this levy. Um, since 2020, we've provided over 10,000 free counseling sessions, which is huge. We contract through subcontracts with about 35 therapists that serve our population. Um, there's little to no wait time. I think the average is uh, 10 days and that's including intake. That's to actually start seeing a therapist. Um, we have on-site therapy. There's also telehealth, all sorts of different options. Um, and that can be, again, people that don't qualify for VA or there's a known very long wait for VA mental health services and really bridging that gap. Um, people can get up to 30 free sessions with us. And so it could be the veteran gets 30 and a family member is also getting 30 and they're not combined. Okay, that was quick. That's my rundown of things. My contact information um, is up on the screen. I'll also put my desk phone number. The phone number here is my cell phone, which I have all the phones with me all the time. So feel free to call either of them, but I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see people again. I'm also happy to email these slides out if it's useful to have that reference. Um, and again, always happy to answer questions or just sort of case conference somebody with you. Uh, Megan, thank you so much. That was a really uh, comprehensive overview of services and why the King County um, Veterans Program is so unique. Um, and how you're really embedded in this community and really lowering barriers for people that, um, you know, may have multiple uh, issues at play in trying to access various services. So I am seeing stuff coming in through the chat. Please continue to throw your, we've got about seven more minutes for uh, question and answer. So we're doing great on time. Early in the uh, top of the meeting, um, we did have a question from Sean that I think probably got answered uh, in your presentation. But Sean, if you have more that you want to add to that question, please either come off mute or throw it in the chat. Um, and then Jesus said, is the expansion for veterans with other than honorable discharge for medical benefits also? And so I know you talked about the wellness program, but maybe you can also talk about just the other side of benefits as well, please. Yeah, that is a great and slightly complex question because the VA is a complex beast. Um, so they expanded eligibility to OTH for housing. They also expanded it in a somewhat limited way for mental health. So someone could present, let's say to the VA um, emergency department or the crisis line, and they could be connected to either VA care or community care for mental health. And there's a lot of regulations around that. Um, but not to primary care, let's say, full VHA benefits. So they slightly expanded it. We're hopeful that they will expand it more in the future. Um, and then again, like we can help bridge financially some other gaps that they might have. Um, we can also work on those discharge upgrades, which I think are really important. And actually our NJP partners are the only ones in Washington state that are doing that work right now. Awesome. Thank you. You're getting lots of uh, kudos and thanks in the chat because this was such amazing information and the program you offer is really wonderful. And um, we would love the slides. Um, we love to include that in our blog that Tim writes up. Um, and so super helpful for that. Um, other thoughts, comments, questions um, that folks have for Megan? Also, if you sent me a direct message, I will be following up with you. Um, Thank you, Megan. Whether offline or, or in the chat. Um, 
Yes, I am so happy, Alex, to answer this question about the state's IVERS program, um, which is Incarcerated Veterans Reintegration. Um, and Megan, I'm going to read it out loud just to capture it for our recording. Sure. Um, so we do have that question. The state's incarcerated um, veterans program ended. Will King County Veterans Program be adding any programs specifically around reentry? Yeah, what happened in this levy, and I don't want to go too, too deep. Um, also to note, the implementation plan that we have drafted is still with council, so subject to change. I don't expect that this one will change. Um, the program is still there. The program is still there and actually funded the exact same as it was before. It's just coming internal to King County. Um, so my staff will be running that. We are rethinking some of the program structures to potentially make it more accessible. Um, the large reason for that was funding. We were always adding in, in the past few years, funding from another strategy that just wasn't able to spend. Um, that strategy is no longer funded. And so we needed more than 80,000 a year. The way that we can do that is with our funding through King County Vets Program, because we also have that second funding stream. Um, so we're blending that so that we can really robustly fund it with financial assistance, as well as to at least two to begin with, full-time staff and a supervisor. Um, so the services are still there. The services will still be um, going on site into the jails, connecting to our resources. One of our hopes is that um, because it's internal to the county, it, the people working in it will have a really close connection to public health and to um, the Department of Adult and Juvenile Detention. So hoping to strengthen some partnerships um, as well as increase the funding for the program. But thank you so much for uh, asking that question. I think there's been a lot out there about that and I want people to know the services are still there. Thank you for that. Um, we still have a couple more minutes if there's other thoughts, questions, comments. Also, if you're on the edge of a thought or <laughs> typing that's allowed, you can put it in. Megan has to leave um, uh, at 10, but uh, we can 100% follow up with her um, or um, she did put her um, info in the chat so you can follow up directly um, and you're getting some thank yous for that information on the state's incarcerated veterans program. Yeah, our goal is to really in the next levy not decrease services, but increase them and the impact, which might look different in how we do the programming, but we're hoping the end goal um, is to have more resources out there. Counseling is one of those places. I will, if nobody has anything, give one suggestion. I mentioned it before, please, please, please. If you are working directly with folks and asking them at any point, or even if you're not asking them about veteran or military status, please pose it as, have you ever served a day in the military? That is such a difference maker for us. And I can't tell you how many people say no. And then when we define it, say actually, yes. Um, and that family member, you know, do you live with or depend on someone who's ever served a day in the military? We're gonna get a lot more people that way. Um, this year already, we've seen a 30% increase in the veterans we're serving. So about 2,500 people so far this year. Um, and Tim something um i think that's that might have been me Allison, we all show yeah. up as coalition on homelessness sorry megan because <laughs> we all logged in through our um shared account um first of all i add my thanks it's uh wonderful to have you here in this capacity with your work hat on and such a wealth of resources um so thank you very much. And thanks for coming to the South King County Forum as well to share this information. I, I wanna just offer kind of an, an observation, the language that you just shared with people, the way to, to, to pose the question that is as inclusive uh, and door opening as possible is so powerful and useful. Um, it's, very striking over and over and over that what we see is that we are making progress in reducing homelessness among veterans 
And the reason is because of the wealth of resources relative to other groups of people who experience homelessness um, that are dedicated to this group of folks. And I think it's important, you know, obviously for people who are serving folks who may be eligible, who have served a day um, in the military or who have other than honorable discharge who may count themselves out. But it's also important for our sector as a whole to be reminded about what's possible when you unite the Veterans Administration and HUD and the Department of Social and uh, DHHS, D yeah, the federal DSHS, um, to provide the resources that people need, both while they're experiencing homelessness and to, to get housed. And it's also important as we think about, you know, the the hateful or dismissive or punitive ways in which people experiencing homelessness are generally talked about. So I just want to, you know, offer that up for all of us as we're thinking about how we bring not only the resources that you just shared, but the approach and the language that you just shared to all our work, our work as service providers, our work as advocates in the policy arena. The fact that um, many, many people in this country are more willing to see a veteran experiencing homelessness as quote unquote deserving of help is both frustrating and an opportunity. And I think it's a, a really valuable thing um, that you've that you have a program that uh, that is maximally accessible. <laughs> and I and I just want to underscore that that is not the case. Um, in most other communities. It's great to hear the federal VA has broadened their definition as well. But this is something for us to take and learn from. That's all. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Allison. And thanks to everybody for listening to me uh, in my presentation. And, and I agree. I think a lot of it is how we approach it. Um, and just, I'm really grateful to work in this community, a community that has signed on to a levy that adds this flexibility that we can have. And we are really leading in the country on these services. And I, I hope being a role model for other places to do this. So I will drop a little bit more in the chat, but thank you so much. Megan, thank you so much for being here. This was incredibly informative and just a wealth of resources. Um, and before I transition us uh, to <clears throat> our uh, coalition staff sharing and our advocacy work, I just want to, um, the one thing that always stuck with me in addition to the language that you just shared about how to describe military service was, um, you said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but like, we try to get to the yes. And I think you said it earlier today, and it might have even been in your presentation. So I just want to, it's just removing barriers and trying to get to the yes is just such a beautiful place to start. And I appreciate that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. And I'm going to hand it off to my other lovely and wonderful colleague, Hallie Willis, to get us excited about local budgets. Take it away, Hallie. Thanks, Jody. Um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. If we haven't met before, I'm Hallie Willis. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the community policy manager with the Coalition on Homelessness. Um, and a good chunk of what we've been up to at the coalition now is we've been um, deeply involved in budget advocacy, both with the city of Seattle and also King County, um, trying to secure additional and necessary funding for homelessness services. Um, Really, when we do advocacy around the budget and also um, around other things like the VSHSL implementation plan, which I'll talk about in a second, we really try and um, push on every funding stream that we can to secure um, additional funding for um, those who are serving people experiencing homelessness. So that's sort of the, the overall picture. Um, and we are um, sort of at the tail end of the Seattle budget process. We're sort of more in the middle of the King County budget process. Um, and where we're at in the city of Seattle is um, we have gotten some really significant uh, amendments added to the budget. 
Um, thanks to the advocacy of some folks who are here, um, the advocacy of our staff, the advocacy of many of our members. Um, we've had over, um, I think about a hundred people who have taken action with us either by um, writing their city council members or joining us at public comment. Um, we've gotten amendments that would add about $3 million to the Seattle budget for um, both inflation adjustments um, for homelessness services providers so they can keep up with the costs of insurance and pay their bills and keep their doors open. Um, and also adding 2% uh, wage adjustments um, for many providers as well. Um, so huge, huge thank you to everyone who has um, joined us in that advocacy. Council members really um, heard our message and you know, we of course really appreciate the leadership of um, Council Member Teresa Mosqueda, Council Member Lisa Herbold and others who have um, joined us in these really, really important efforts. Um, so I might ask one of my colleagues to drop um, an opportunity to take action into the chat. Um, where we're at now that we've gotten those amendments added to the budget, they've been approved by the budget committee, um, and now they have to be approved by the full council. Um, and we expect the council to take action on the 21st of this month. So um, there is still time and still need to take action and um, make sure that the full council um, knows how important these adjustments really are. Um, we're also sort of in the middle of budget advocacy at King County. We've been meeting with um, many council members and really making the case that they should um, join Seattle in adding funding for homelessness services. Um, King County is in a tighter, much tighter budget situation than Seattle, so it's a tougher fight. Um, but um, please do take action. Please join us. Um, you can use that same link to um, write to your King County Council members um, and urge them uh, to add funding in their budget for homelessness services as well. Um, and in King County, we're expecting their budget committee, which is called the Budget and Fiscal Management Committee, um, to take action on any um, amendments to the budget and then pass their budget onto the full council on November 22nd. And we expect the full council to take action on November 28th. So all of these budget processes are really wrapping up at the end of November. So we're um, kind of in our final push for action um, on those budgets. Um, Allison, is there anything else you wanted to add on the budgets? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I think just a little bit of context, especially for folks who may not have as much experience tracking through budget processes. Um, we have said this before, but I find it's always useful to um, remind people this is the second year of a biennial budget. That means that very little is actually going to change in this budget despite the fact that we all know there is an urgent ongoing need for increased services. The reason that you're not hearing about bigger and more advocacy around added resources is there are very limited opportunities to do that at this point in the budget. Um, and the election has a real effect on that as well. And we're gonna talk about the recent election in a moment here. Um, in addition to council members, Herbold and Mosqueda, who have truly been champions for understanding the nature of human services and specifically homeless services and housing, council members Morales, Sawant, Lewis, and Strauss have been, and Juarez, have been strong partners in ensuring that the inflation adjustment and wage adjustment apply to all homeless service and housing providers. The reason that we had to go in this depth in this budget process is because about 40 of our member organizations and their staff and the people they serve and house were excluded by the initial proposal in the budget. And they were excluded in part because 
of the technicality of the creation of the Regional Homelessness Authority and the administrative shifting of contract management from the city to the RHA. Well, that should not penalize the folks who do the work. Also, we are still grappling, as many, many others are, with the effects of having had significant one-time or COVID-era funding from the federal government that actually started to get us closer to what we actually need to serve people in our community. But those funds, um, in most cases, have ended or are about to end. And so what we saw, for example, where um, the Jumpstart tax was actually increased thanks to remarkable advocacy um, from people in the Seattle public schools, including students, faculty, teachers, school social workers, counselors, and parents. We now see, you know, I think really an unprecedented last minute addition of $20 million for supporting student mental health in the Seattle public schools. Um, if you'd asked me even a month ago if I thought that was really possibly going to happen, I would have said, mm, not so sure, but it's looking really good. Nevertheless, that is extraordinary. So among the reasons that we want you to take action, even though we're very close to the final vote, is because first of all, we want to be able to invite you to thank the council members, some of whom are leaving the council and some of whom are staying. One of the values of this coalition is we thank the folks who show up in solidarity and the elected officials who do things that we need them to do and who listen and respond. So we want your help to thank those council members, but also because we have so much more that we are going to need to advocate around. Um, and it starts immediately. Council is now discussing potential additional progressive revenue sources at the city of Seattle. And we strongly support additional progressive revenue. And we know it's not magic and it's not gonna happen without a lot of advocacy. So please join us in taking action. If you've already done so, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who's shown up and made public comment. It really makes a difference. And then at King County, I guess the thing I wanna say is we're continuing to urge King County to match the Seattle inflation adjustment and wage adjustment. And just because it doesn't look very good in the budget doesn't mean that we shouldn't say it because it is necessary. Our advocacy continues again immediately because the biennial budget starts again at King County and the King County Regional Homelessness Authority gets almost all its funding from the city of Seattle and from King County. And that biennial budget is going to be the subject of a lot of our advocacy. So that's the context for those of you who might not be as deep in the weeds as Hallie and I have to be. <laughs> um, and the opportunity to take action literally will take you two to three minutes, even if you personalize a statement. Um, okay, I think I'm kicking it back to you, Hallie. Thanks, Allison. And as always, if you have questions, um, Allison and I are quite deep in the weeds, so please feel free to, um, to email me, happy to. Um, bring you into the weeds with me if you if that's what you're interested in. Um, and in addition to the budget, we are really working hard on um, the Veteran Seniors and Human Services Implementation Plan. Um, as Megan was talking about, um, voters just approved a renewal of the Veteran Seniors and Human Services levy. Um, it will provide six years of really significant funding for services for veterans, seniors, and resilient communities. Um, and the process that we're in right now is the implementation plan, which really um, lays out how that all that money will be spent over the next six years. Um, it's in the process of being approved by the King County Council. Um, and one thing that we are really interested in is this uh, this levy included for the first time um, a significant investment in human services workforce stabilization. Um, it includes $58 million um, over the next six years for stabilizing the human services workforce. This is something that um, we are deeply interested in. Um, and deeply interested in making sure that stays. 
in the implementation plan as it goes through the King County Council. Um, so that is um, really all our engagement with King County Council members and their staff and um, in our taking action and are asking you to take action, um, that is what we are really focused on is making sure that 58 million is um, protected in the plan. It is kept for um, stabilizing the human services workforce and it's not pulled away um, for other projects as this plan makes its way through the council. And so um, we expect um, to find out on Friday if there are any amendments that council members are um, looking at making to the implementation plan. So I think we're in a really critical window right now of um, taking action and making sure that folks hear how critical that funding source is. And Hallie, we had a great question in the chat. What does oh, workforce yeah. stabilization mean? Um, thank you for asking that, Emil. It is an excellent question. In a simple way, what it means is making sure that the contracts for work that is funded through the Vet Seniors and Human Services Levy include enough money to keep up with inflation and to pay workers. Because we worked closely with King County, and this is part of our strategy, here's our big secret strategy, add additional funding into every funding source and every budget at every level of government so that we make up for years of suppressed wages and inadequate contract amounts in this sector. That's our big secret strategy. Um, and so, but what we know, what you all know, what you've told us over and over, and what we have in turn told the people developing the implementation plan is that we also need flexibility because there are small organizations that may have only a few contracts and a relatively small number of staff. And there are big organizations that run 24 seven services in multiple locations. Some have union representation, some do not. And we, what we need is we need to lift the entire sector, but we need some flexibility. I will say there's another piece of this that is not so happy. Like we're really thrilled that that $58 million stabilization fund is in there. It is unprecedented. It's only there because of our collective advocacy, the King County Alliance for Human Services, the Coalition Ending Gender-Based Violence and many other groups saying, this, this is not adequate funding. We need to address this in the levy, just as we did with the crisis care centers levy. However, it works out to less than $10 million a year across the life of the levy, across all those services. That is not going to be adequate. And also we know that the general fund in King County is going to be taking painful hits of more than $100 million as is the general fund in the city of Seattle. And so this levy money may need to be used even for supporting services outside the levy. That's the danger zone that we are squarely in. We think they've done a really good job in the language of putting some boundaries around it and saying what it will look like to expand eligibility to apply for additional funds. Um, if you're interested in the details, Hallie and I can um, show you what the details look like, but they really do reflect and honor, I think, the complexity of the circumstances that our member organizations are experiencing and told King County about. Um, there are cuts in the King County budget and there are cuts coming that are going to be worse next year. So that's part of why we really need um, you all to not only take action in this budget, in this part of the budget process, but actually to stand with us as we go into a critical biennial budget year and the state legislative session. Thanks, Allison. And um, just to add a little bit more detail to like, what are we talking about when we're talking about human services workforce stabilization? Um, that means increased wages, improved benefits, um, reduced cost of living. So like 
subsidies for housing or education or childcare, um, and also professional development and other training that can improve um, service quality and also staff wellness. Um, and if I sounded like a robot saying that, it's because that is literally the text from the VSHSL implementation plan. So um, that's how they are defining it. Um, and we are really working to um, strongly protect that. Awesome, you're getting some thank yous from Nathan and the statement of this is so critical. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna pause a little bit. Oh, what are current slash planned resources, services with safety privacy considerations available for um, survivors of um, domestic violence, interpersonal violence, sexual assault, for both uh, veterans and the general population in the city of Seattle and King County? Um, that um, is a big I, question. That's a big question. I think what I'm going to say, Amy, is, is your question about in the new Vet Seniors and Human Services levy? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to suggest that Hallie can um, share with you the link so you can actually read what's in the implementation plan. Um, and there is definitely an opportunity. You can even use our action alert to submit comments about that if you are so inclined. Um, I think we have a couple more things we need to talk about in this staff update session. We really want to make sure there's time for um, folks, including Amy Hagopian, to share community announcements that are uh, of common interest. So. Um, in, in a broad way, I will say that um, survivors of gender-based violence um, are, you know, well supported in the VET Seniors and Human Services levy, and here's the but. But the reason that we advocated for a bigger levy overall is still, of course, not even remotely enough. So <laughs> um, there are there are a lot of um, strong supports in that levy um, for folks who are survivors. Um, and I'm sure Hallie can connect you with the even the relevant part in that big document. Um, I'm going to just take a couple minutes to talk with folks about another uh, advocacy area that we are working on, which is our work in Burien. I think as many of you know, uh, the situation uh, in Burien has kind of gone downhill. Uh, because in addition to the fact that there are a fairly sizable number of people without shelter, without housing, and for the most part, without many services in Burien, um, there is one families with children shelter, thank you to Mary's Place in the city of Burien, but that's it, and they are full. And um, the winter shelter, which has been run by community volunteers, um, in a church, uh, not winter, severe weather, is actually now serving some of the approximately 300 asylum seekers who have been sheltering in uh, Tukwila Church. So that will not be opening as homeless shelter. Uh, the city council passed a terrible ordinance, Ordinance 818, which they then amended, Ordinance 827, which essentially bans people from being homeless in public spaces in the city of Burien. And we have been spending the last several months not only um, listening to housed folks in Burien and showing up at city council meetings and talking with elected officials, um, but we've also been doing outreach in terms of not services, but listening and engagement with folks experiencing unsheltered homelessness in Burien. Um, Jody and I and a couple of colleagues of ours have been um, talking with people, holding drop-in and listening sessions at the public library, going to some community events, and also going to the space where folks are camped that's highly visible um, on Ambaum. And um, I just want to let you all know that we are continuing to be uh, closely engaged on the ground there. 
Um, Nancy Kick, who's often at these meetings, is a community member who's been deeply involved. Some of you all may have strong connections and or live or work in Burien, in which case, please do let Jody and me know if we haven't spoken to you already. Um, as we like to say, we're exploring all our options. So um, stay tuned and we look forward to, um, I think, an opportunity for better results um, and better policies, not only in that community, but really across our region. Um, one of the reasons we are putting as much effort into this as we are is because uh, we really think this is a blow to regionalism and to the shared responsibility that we speak of in our vision statement, um, that this is a region where everyone understands that we have a shared responsibility to ensure that everyone has a home. So um, I will, um, I wanna, I see things in the chat, which I'll um, take some time to respond to, but I wanna also give Tim a few minutes to just give a quick roll up of what work he has helped to lead along with um, our volunteers, our awesome voting rights volunteers and staff at our member and partner organizations. It's pretty impressive what's been going on um, to ensure that everybody who's eligible gets a chance to exercise their voting rights. So Tim, I think you're gonna do a, just a quick roll up to give, give folks a sense of, this, of the reach. Yeah, thank you so much. Is my audio working correctly now? Great, okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, we've mentioned a number of types of advocacy today. As you know, voting is yet another type of advocacy. And I would say a special role uh, for passionate advocates is helping to allow others to, have, to exercise their right to vote. Uh, and we've been doing exactly that um, since the end of September until election day. We had 18 events all around the county from Auburn to Bellevue to Burien to Renton and all around Seattle in day centers, libraries, resource fairs, overnight shelters, and enhanced shelters and food banks. Lots of different spaces, lots of different types of um, experiences that we've interacted with. You know, people who've never known that they have the right to vote to people who are very politically savvy and just need to be reminded that they they can do so or, or just need to be reminded to fill out their ballot. I wanna give a special shout out to all of our volunteers who helped us make this happen to visit all of these spaces because I can't do it alone. Um, I saw that we have one volunteer in our group, Chaz. Uh, feel free to come off, um, to come on camera or, or wave to us. We really appreciate your help. Chaz is also going to be joining us at the Behavioral Health Legislative Forum, where we're doing a little bit of voter engagement prior to the main event. Um, thank you so much. And then, of course, we we've um, and we've had so many other people help us. If anyone that you know is interested in supporting these efforts, we will be holding training events uh, in the new year in line with future elections. So please email me if you are if you know someone who is interested in showing up to register on house voters um, or if you work with a service site that would like us to table or present to people who are interested in learning more about their rights and how they can exercise those rights. Um, yeah, just a little recap. I do want to give time for anybody um, who wants to share amongst within our community, but I'm also happy to take any brief questions if you have about our voting engagement work. All right, I'm going to pass it back to uh, back to folks who want to share community announcements. Before we do that, we've got a little bit of an election wrap up. If we can keep it brief. That's relevant. Yes. Beautiful. Allison, to you. Um I yes, thank you, Jody. Um so somebody uh our 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 wonderful um friend Karina put in the chat that the election in in Burian went poorly. Here's, here is the real fact of the matter. While we all have our um, individual personal opinions, it is really true that at the coalition, we work with any elected in good faith who is interested in understanding 
what actually works and in working to implement good policies and effective services and solutions in their community. We have all seen people who have had the capacity to grow and change and learn while they hold elected office. We hold that hope. And also, we don't put up with nonsense. So we walk that line um, and we are, um, you know, pretty interested in making sure that we hold good working relationships with a pretty wide range of elected officials. Um, we are interested in um, hearing from you guys about what you think of the elections in your respective communities. There were a wide range of results where there are 39 different cities in King County. I've heard from a number of um, people whom we work with that they're very pleased with the positions of people who got elected um, and other people who are very disappointed. And both those things are true. So we'd love to hear from you about what happened in your jurisdictions, your communities. And it is always, always necessary and important to begin with the opportunity to meet and to educate newly elected officials, many of whom actually are learning their jobs on the job and have staff who may likely not have served in policymaking roles before. So one of the things that's also very, very interesting is these are often small communities, not only small in terms of just a few hundred votes sometimes or less, separating the winner from the loser, um, but also in terms of you never know who went to high school with whom and whose cousin is all of a sudden going to be staffing a newly elected council member in your jurisdiction. So if you know some of the people who got elected or you know some of the people who are taking on positions working in their offices, please let us know that also. It's a really important thing. Um, Hallie's going to be leading our work, reaching out to newly elected people in multiple jurisdictions um, and letting them know about the things that actually are effective in helping people experiencing homelessness. Um, I think I will just leave it at that and maybe turn next to Amy, who has a beautiful example of one of the tools that we may use to help educate newly elected folks. And I really want to thank you, Amy, for um, being here today to share the fruits of what I'm sure were um, extensive labors to bring about this resolution. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, including me in the meeting today. Um, so many of you know I'm on faculty at University of Washington, at, where I have worked on a number of homelessness re related research and student projects. Um, and I'm also a member of the Caucus on Homelessness within the American Public Health Association, which includes a few hundred people who care about this issue as their primary public health work. Um, so last year, the caucus uh, at our annual meeting agreed to work on uh, developing a comprehensive policy statement for our national organization uh, on the topic of um, homeless encampment displacement, forcible displacement, sweeps, however you want to use the terminology. Uh, and we did a very carefully researched paper on how sweeps harm the health of people experiencing homelessness. So uh, if people would like to have access to this statement, it will soon be on the website of the American Public Health Association and the policy section of the website. Um, it's a well-researched policy statement and should be used in your advocacy work to encourage state and local health officials to stop this policy. Thank you, Amy.